Yeah. Thank you, Acting President. Uh, Acting President, I rise this afternoon to oppose this bill, uh, which seeks to extend the period of state of emergency. Acting President, uh, the Public Health and Wellbeing Act, uh, Section 198, provides that the Minister for Health, on the advice of the Chief Health Officer, officer uh, may declare a state of emergency, and when that is declared, it allows the Chief Health Officer to then impose a range of directions. Uh, a range of directions which, uh, as all Victorians know, uh, are draconian in nature. They restrict uh, where people can go, what people can do. They can direct that people be detained in certain ways. They can even direct uh, health treatment. And when the original Act was put in place and that, pr that provision was made, it was with a view that that would be used in exceptional circumstances and typically in a targeted short-term way. In fact, the Act provided that a state of, state of emergency could only be declared for one month and it could be extended, uh, renewed, for a maximum of six months. And that was done for a very particular reason, because it recognised, the Parliament recognised, uh, that the powers granted to the Chief Health Officer through the declaration of a state of emergency uh, were enormous, uh, they required enormous trust and they required uh, appropriate constraints. We saw last year in September the government come to this parliament seeking to extend that six month maximum to 12 months and that was passed by this parliament uh, in September or just passed by this parliament in September uh, and now the government is back wanting to add a further nine months to uh, that state maximum state of emergency period. As I said acting president the powers the state of emergency grant to the chief health officer uh, effectively to the government are draconian. Uh, the imposition on the lives of Victorians, the way in which Victorians live, move about, the way in which visitors come to this state or not come to this state, as we have seen, uh, are enormous. And the exercise of those powers requires enormous trust by the people in their government. And that trust over the last 12 months has been comprehensively broken. We have to ask Acting President, why is this needed? When this first state of emergency was declared in March and April of last year, uh, it was on the basis that we needed to flatten the curve. We don't hear that phrase anymore, but back in March and April of last year, we were told we needed to flatten the curve, which meant we had to slow the growth in the rate of COVID infections so that our health system was not overrun. We were told by the then health minister, who was subsequently thrown under the bus and has left, that we had limits on the health system capacity, uh, the number of COVID cases was growing and we needed to slow that growth rate so the health system uh, wasn't overrun. Well, we jump forward 12 months to March 2021 and there is no pressure on the health system from COVID. Uh, there are few, if any, people in the health system, in hospital, in intensive care, in relation to COVID. If there's any, it might be one or two people. Uh, there is not pressure on the health system that we were warned about uh, a year ago. In fact, uh, the number of deaths in Victoria over the last 12 months uh, is lower than it was in 2019. Look at the last eight months in particular, it's down by about 6%. 1,500 fewer people died in Victoria in the last eight months compared to uh, the same period in the previous year. So the crisis the government predicted a year ago hasn't come to pass, but enormous damage to the Victorian community and the Victorian economy has as a consequence of the way in which this government has used the restrictions uh, under the state of emergency. When the government came to the parliament last September seeking an extension, uh, the opposition opposed it, as we will oppose it today, because we had seen the way in which the government had used the state of emergency powers to that point, and in fact was using them at that time with an unprecedented lockdown which went for more than 100 days which was arbitrary in nature, it was badly managed, and it had no regard to the impact it was having on the Victorian community and on the Victorian economy. We saw the Minister for Health, who took the legislation through at that point in time, before she was thrown under the bus, uh, answer questions in committee about the bill, about the way in which the government made decisions around the use of the legislation and the use of those powers. Uh, and it was clear from her answers, there was no consideration of the broader impacts of state of emergency declaration, the broader impacts on community health, the broader impacts on the economy. Uh, the government was using uh, the health advice 
as a fig leaf. And they continue to do to this day, and we heard the Minister for Small Business in question time today uh, do as much. Well, health advice is not a shield for the government because it is the government's role to make decisions which are bigger than simply the advice from the Chief Health, Officer, Chief Health Officer or the Health Department. Because the impacts of what you are doing and what you have done over the last 12 months are far bigger than just the COVID pandemic. Because the impacts on the Victorian economy, the impacts on Victorian families are far wider than simply the COVID situation. And the best example of that was the five-day lockdown we endured a fortnight ago, where because of two or three cases in the community in a population of six million, we saw impacts on every single household, every single business in this state, which were dramatic, uh, were long-term, and in many cases were irreversible. So to, to hide behind the fig leaf of health advice is simply a dereliction of leadership on the part of this government, because there are far more considerations, far more factors which need to be taken into consideration uh, in exercising powers under a state of emergency than we are seeing from this government. When the legislation came forward last September, uh, the coalition, Liberal National Coalition proposed that any extension should only be on a one-month basis with reviews by the parliament. That was to ensure there was a check and balance on the government in the way in which it exercised the powers under a state of emergency. The parliament, this chamber, voted not to go down that path. We saw three members of this chamber, Dr Ratnam, uh, Mr Medic uh, and Ms Patton, uh, vote with the government, vote with the Labor Party to pass the extension uh, to the state of emergency. And those three members are complicit in the damage and destruction which has followed with the state of emergency since it was passed in September uh, of last year. One of the requirements of the Public Health and Wellbeing Act at Section uh, 9 is the requirement for uh, proportionality. Section 9 of the Act says decisions made and actions taken in the administration of this Act should be proportionate to the public health risk sought to be prevented, minimised or controlled and should not be made or taken in an arbitrary manner. That is exactly opposite to what this government has done. And again, the five-day lockdown two weeks ago for three or four cases is the best example of that. And when the Premier was asked why was it statewide, the answer was essentially because it's convenient. We have a statewide lockdown because it's convenient. We haven't got ourselves organised to have a barrier between metro and regional areas, so for convenience we'll have a statewide lockdown, which is in no way consistent with the principle of proportionality which the Health and Wellbeing Act requires. So what we've seen uh, on that instance and in numerous other instances is an illegal use of the state of emergency, a use which is contradictory uh, in contrast with the requirements of uh, Section 9 of the Public Health and Wellbeing Act. We saw the debacle on New Year's Eve where suddenly, in mid-afternoon, the acting Premier closed the border between Victoria and New South Wales, with no regard to the impact. We saw people who were in New South Wales, Victorians in New South Wales, having to suddenly pack up their camps over, over the border in uh, Moama and Albury and elsewhere, uh, people who may already have started uh, festivities for New Year's Eve, having to drive back over the border to get to Victoria by midnight, and the government having no regard to the impact, those impacts, the danger that created, uh, because of the directions it was issuing. Again, no regard to the proportionality requirement uh, of the Act, no regard to the consequences, the broader consequences, far beyond the impact of COVID that these uh, directions it makes, uh, it has been making, are having. We already know that 150,000 jobs have been lost in Victoria. We have a dozen cases currently in the community and we have 150,000 jobs lost. For every day the economy is shut down, for every day we are in lockdown, the estimate is three to four hundred million dollars is lost from Victorian businesses. That five-day lockdown, that so-called circuit breaker, the Premier declared in a panic a fortnight ago, cost the Victorian economy well over a billion dollars for four or five cases, because this government is so incompetent it can't even manage its contact tracing. We shut down the whole economy for five days at enormous cost to the community, at enormous cost uh, to businesses. We saw this morning, Acting President, with the release of the uh, Royal Commission into Mental Health, the hypocrisy of this Premier and the hypocrisy of this government, because 
No one has done more damage to the mental health of Victorians over the last 12 months than Daniel Andrews has. No one has done more damage in the history of this state to the mental health of its citizens than Daniel Andrews has, as we saw over the last 12 months. And in fact, Acting President, I received on this issue an email this afternoon from a constituent of mine who lives in Dingley. And I'll read the three relevant paragraphs onto the record. It arrived at uh, three o'clock this afternoon. Uh, Hi Gordon, I couldn't agree more. Both my 53-year-old wife and my 14-year-old daughter are now suffering from extreme depression. The last five-day lockdown was the final straw for my 14-year-old daughter. They are now both about to begin 12 weeks psychological counselling. My daughter actually mutilated her wrists with a screwdriver. And the irony is that the Andrews government created the problem in Victoria. How can the government not even understand the basics of quarantine which have been established since time immemorial? That is the impact your lockdowns are having on the community. And you have no regard to that impact. Jenny McCarkis, the former health minister, stood in this place when the extension was given six months ago saying, oh, we got the health advice from the chief health officer and we haven't looked at the other factors. For four or five cases in the community, you lock down the economy for five days and as this, this email shows, you have a 14-year-old girl attempting to harm herself with a screwdriver as a consequence of the impact that had on her. And there are thousands of families, thousands of people in Victoria with a similar story to tell because of this government's first inability to manage uh, the COVID situation last year, but also its complete disregard for the need for proportionality in the use of state of emergency restrictions and in managing the impact of the COVID situation versus the broader impacts in this state. And this is having enormous impact on confidence. Uh, confidence for investors, confidence for citizens. You know, talk to any Victorian about their willingness to travel, their willingness to book a motel, to go interstate, to go to a regional city. Uh, their confidence is shattered. That five-day lockdown a fortnight ago has shattered confidence across this state because people know it can happen at any time. Uh, with no reason. An arbitrary decision by a panicked Premier, three or four cases and the, and the state is shut down. That is not the way to run a state. That is not the way to ensure confidence in the community, uh, to ensure confidence in business. And we've heard today the impacts of people leaving the state, professionals leaving the state, business investment which is going to be uh, deferred or diverted uh, to, other, uh, to other states. That lockdown we saw uh, florists who had planned for uh, Valentine's Day, you know, tens of thousands of dollars of stock going to waste. Uh, restaurants and cafes that had planned for Valentine's Day, tens of thousands of dollars of stock going to waste. And you seem to think you can turn it back on a couple of days later. It doesn't work like that. And some of those businesses which closed two weeks ago will not reopen at all because of your inability to manage and your inability to recognise the need for proportionality in the restrictions that you are imposing ostensibly because of COVID. So we're very much of the view that if there is any extension to the state of emergency beyond the exp uh, expiration in mid-March, it needs to be tightly limited and there needs to be tight oversight. And that is why we'll again be proposing amendments to restrict the length of any state of emergency extension to mo no more than one month at a time with the government to come back to the parliament uh, for uh, future uh, endorsement. And I'd say to those members of the crossbench who voted with the government six months ago and who have done enormous damage and share culpability for the enormous damage which has occurred in this state over the last uh, six months, enormous damage to mental health, enormous damage to families, enormous damage to jobs, uh, now is not the time to stand with Dan. Now is the time to stand with the people of Victoria and reject this extension of state of emergency. Yeah, yeah.